and then uh, we'll let you go ahead and start admitting people, Marcus. Please stand by a few minutes. Thank you. So uh, good morning to um, all. Uh, as Marcus just uh, requested, please uh, please turn off your video. This is for bandwidth reasons, and please uh, mute your microphones. Uh, this is for background noise reasons. Uh, you'll be allowed to, uh, to speak later on, uh, but for now, please mute your mics and turn off your videos. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Michiel Vredenberg. I'm the program coordinator of COSCAP Southeast Asia. Uh, I want to give you a very warm welcome to this, uh, this webinar on the global reporting format, uh, also known as uh, GRF. Uh, I'm very pleased that we are welcoming uh, not only the COSCAP C member states, but also uh, member states of COSCAP South Asia, COSCAP North Asia, and even the regional safety oversight organization in the Pacific called uh, PASO, which is the Pacific Aviation Safety Office. So uh, I really want to welcome everybody to this because it's an APAC wide uh, webinar. And uh, as you know, because you're here, it's, uh, it's on a topic that uh, we all uh, uh, are thinking about because of, of its uh, imminent uh, implementation deadline. So we have one hour for this webinar. Uh, following my introduction, there will be a presentation from a state, Malaysia, who have made a lot of progress uh, towards implementation, and they will share with us uh, their experience. Uh, that will take about, uh, about half an hour, maybe a little bit more, and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. And then just before we close, uh, we'll discuss a couple of, uh, of next steps. So the presenter from Malaysia will be uh, Mr. Mayuddin uh, Bin Sayuri. He's the Deputy Director of Aerodrome Standards of the Civil Aviation Authority of, uh, of Malaysia. And he's also an experienced uh, training instructor on, on many topics, including, uh, including this GRF. So um, we're recording this uh, webinar. This is for the benefit of others who are unable to join us today. So please be aware that we are doing this and that we'll make it publicly available. So, uh, so uh, we're not expecting to discuss any confidential matters. So, so there should be no problem. But if you had any concern, please be aware of that. Uh, as I mentioned, the question of answer period will be after the presentation. Uh, the way it will work is um, at the bottom, you have a menu. Uh, in your Zoom application and, and uh, you see the word participants. When you click on that, you'll have a dialog box open on the right hand side with the names of all the participants. And at the bottom of that, you'll have a button which says raise hand. So the way to ask questions after the presentation is to click on raise hand and then we'll know that somebody uh, has a question and then uh, the, we'll call upon you to ask your question. And uh, depending on who the best person is to answer, uh, we, we will provide you uh, the answer accordingly. Uh, there's also a chat room function, but we are not using that to ask questions. Yeah, we're using only the raise hand function, but you can use the chat room to make any comments uh, that we will see after the webinar, not during, uh, regarding uh, if you have any feedback for us on how to improve uh, the webinar, webinar conduct or, or any other matter related to both the content of the, uh, of the uh, webinar in terms of subject matter and uh, the way we've conducted it. I don't want to give too long of an introduction because uh, Mr. Mayuddin is going to explain quite uh, clearly what uh, GRF is all about. But uh, uh, just so you know, GRF is, is, is an acronym that's become well known in terms of awareness and promotion of the concept. But really, it's not something you're going to see in, in the ICAO documents because in the ICAO documents, we refer to the, the uh, methodology and terminology for assessing and reporting the runway surface conditions. And the reason for all of this is to improve safety in aircraft uh, landing and takeoff, uh, particularly landing, uh, because we want to uh, improve uh, the runway excursion uh, incidents uh, to bring them down and, of course, thereby uh, uh, reduce the fatalities associated with them as well. This is an interesting uh, new uh, ICAO requirement because uh, it involves uh, all stakeholders. It involves the airport operator, it involves the ANSP, both from the ATS side and from the AIS side, and uh, also the aircraft operators. So the originators of the information are the airport operator. Uh, the processing of the information is through the ANSP, but then the user of the information is the aircraft operator, and then there's a feedback loop from there back to the originator. So, so you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. But what that means is that this, um, this new requirement for, for its implementation requires a, a lot of collaboration and coordination between all the stakeholders to be able to achieve this, uh, this objective. 
So the new requirements are in Annex Sys primarily 14, but also 3, 6, 8, and 15. Uh, these new requirements are applicable on the 5th of November this year. Uh, associated with that, uh, amendments have been published for three uh, PANs, PANs Aerodromes, PANs AIM, and PANs ATM. And then we also have uh, IKEO manuals and IKEO circuits. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of guidance has been produced to support uh, the new SARPs. Uh, and in addition to that, we have training as well. So training has been developed uh, between IKEO and ACI for airports and between uh, IKEO and IATA for aircraft operators. And uh, currently under development with, uh, with CANSO for ANSPs as well. Uh, so how we got to where we are today is um, really uh, the SARPs have been uh, uh, published for a long time, a few years already. But uh, last year uh, in IKEO headquarters in Montreal, uh, uh, we had the IKEO Global GRF Symposium. And I think that was the first time that we achieved a a, a reasonable global awareness of these new requirements. Uh, we took that to the Asia Pacific region uh, last year as well to be able to conduct in June uh, the uh, APAC regional GRF seminar. So that's when we held the event uh, within our region uh, on, on this subject. And now we're moving on to, uh, to this webinar. Uh, and I'll tell you at the end of our session today uh, what more we plan to do after this. So, so really we are we are trying to uh, not just uh, promote and, and, and generate more awareness on these new requirements, but also provide you the, uh, the foundation on, upon which you can actually develop your implementation plans and, and do your own training. And this training at a national level for all stakeholders is critical. That's the only way that this is going to work. And, and that you'll see that uh, Mr. Mayuddin has, uh, has uh, quite a bit of uh, useful guidance uh, and experience to share with us in that regard. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Mayuddin of the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia uh, to make maybe a very brief introduction and then to commence his, uh, his presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Mayuddin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. I hope everybody can uh, hear me very well. Okay, first of all, I would like to start sharing my PowerPoint presentation and I hope it reaches all of you clearly. Please uh, give me some signal if you don't have it by now. Is it okay, my PowerPoint presentation? Okay. Okay. Today, I would like to share with you some of the things that uh, we have done in Malaysia. My presentation will be divided into two. The first one uh, is related to the GRF, RCR, and the second one is a little bit, just a short time, related to our experience in Malaysia, what we have done so far. So as we know, uh, runway excursion is the aviation number one safety risk category among the top contributing factors, uh, poor working action due to contaminated runways, combined with shortfalls in the accuracy and timelines of assessment and reporting of the runway surface condition. So the, the reporting of runway surface condition must be very timely and very accurate. That's why RCR is introduced. Okay, global reporting format RCR, the content will be what is RCR, objective of the RCR, the benefit, why is the RCR important, the main different main agency roles, the challenges that we face during implementing the roles of different agencies, airport operator, regulator, airline, etc. And also we'll share a little bit on ICO provision and guidance material. What is RCR? It's a standard reporting of runway surface condition. So after this, we expect to standardize throughout the world how we report the runway surface condition. It's a procedure reporting in one system and platform, and it will be applicable on the 5th November 2020. And there are related parties involved, which is aerodrome operator, aircraft operator, pilots, ATC, IM, MED, aircraft manufacturer, etc. So, what are the objectives of RCR? The first one is to assess and report the condition of the movement area. Second one is to provide the assess information in the correct format. And the last one is to report significant, hold on, okay. Report significant changes without delay. 
Okay. So what are the benefits of this GRFRCR? The first one is to improve safety. Why? Because better understanding of runway condition. All are standards. Everybody, especially at aerodrome operator, do a correct assessment, standard formatting, correct formatting, timely manner. So it will be benefit to the air traffic controller and also the pilots. And it will uh, result in the fewer runway excursion. Another one is improved efficiency in terms of flight crews can better correlate reported runway surface condition to contaminated landing and takeoff performance data. And airport, of, sorry, airport operators have an objective method of reporting runway surface condition to flight crews. Okay, why is the RCR very important? The first one is to standardize the reporting of runway surface condition. Everywhere in this world will have a very same and similar standard of reporting the runway surface condition. Second one is to establish a common language with all related parties in airports with one system, aerodrome operator, aircraft operator, pilots, air traffic controller, AIM, metrology, etc. The third one is to allow pilots to accurately determine aeroplane takeoff and landing performance due to the correctness of the report received. The fourth one is to improve aerodrome safety so that better understanding of runway condition and fewer runway excursion. And the third one is due to improve airport operation efficiency so that better decision making and to reduce environment impact result of the better traffic management. So what are the main agency roles? The first one, the airports. They are the one who will assess the runway condition and report using the RCR. The second one is the ATS or AIS. They will convey information from RCR to aircraft operators. And the third one is of course the pilots, the users of the aerodromes. They will use the information with aircraft performance data to determine if the landing or takeoff is safe. Okay, let us see. There are two types of uh, airports. I can say generalize it by two types of airports. The first one is the airport in the area where it is exposed to snow and ice. So for this type of airports in this region, the need is to use the full global reporting format. But the second part is, uh, this is in Malaysia and neighboring countries where we are not really exposed to, not really, we are not exposed at all to snow and ice. So we will use only the section of the global reporting format related to water as contaminant. I, I will show you the detail after this. Okay, let, let me show the example of one of the runway in KLA. In KLA, the third runway is, uh, the number is 15 and 33. So remember in RCR and GRF, we always start with the lower destination number of the runway. So the first one will be on the first third of on your left side, which is one five. Second one in the middle, and the third one is the, the last of the runway three three. Don't start with the runway three three first. You have to start with runway one five first, okay? So what we do, the step one is we, on the first third of your runway, we will measure the percentage coverage of contaminant. So for this area, for Malaysia and remembering area, mostly the component contaminant is water only. We don't have snow, we don't have ice, we have, don't have slush, etc. After we have estimated the percentage coverage or calculated, measured the co coverage of contaminant, we will measure the depth of contaminant. After this, I will show you detail. How millimeter we consider as a, a standing water, how millimeter we consider as only Normal wet, I will show you after this. And the third one is we will uh, measure, uh, we will find out what is the type of contaminant. Like I said before, in Malaysia and this area of region, we just consider the water. Similarly, on the uh, second part of the runway, we will measure the coverage on contaminant, the depth of contaminant, and type of contaminant. And then the third one also, we measure the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, fortunately, uh, ACI has already come out. Eh? produce a very simple uh, type of uh, reporting worksheet that we can use. But uh, please uh, bear in mind that this is not the one that we are going to submit to air traffic controller. But it is very easy for us to train our aerodrome staff to use this form. And then after you use this form, we will uh, summarize it to become the note no time format that I will show you after this. Okay, this is a very uh, important matrix. It is available in pensaerodrome.991. So it is called runway condition assessment metric RCM. But for this type of RCM, I will show you the full version, but this is the modified version, which is suite to our area in Malaysia and neighboring area. 
So it is just covering the dry, wet and standing water only. You can see for RCM, they have six, there are six uh, runway condition curve on your left side. Eh, here, eh? zero, one, two, three, four, five and six. But in Malaysia, we only consider initial assessment is category five and six, which is dry and wet, and category two and three, which is uh, standing water and wet, slippery wet. Okay, I will show you after this why actually we only consider uh, code two, three, four, uh, five, and six. So bear in mind, IQ requirement is that an assign, an assign runway condition to five, four, three, and two shall not be upgraded. So we cannot upgrade the five, four, three, and two. We can we we can only allow the runway condition code one and zero to be upgraded. This is according to IQ requirement. Okay, let me show you the full version of the RCAM. Can you see here? Why actually we in Malaysia only consider the code 6 is because there is dry over here. Why code 5? Because there is wet over here. We don't consider the frost. We don't consider sludge, dry snow and wet snow. That's why we take out from the previous uh, metric just now. So we, don't, we also do not consider this uh, code 4 because it's just uh, related to compacted snow. So we don't have compacted snow in Malaysia and uh, our neighboring countries. Uh, we consider number three because there is wet here and the difference between wet here and wet in uh, code five is in code five it is just normal wet which is three millimeter depth and below but uh, in uh, code three it is also normal wet but it is being downgraded due to some some uh, factors for example report continuous report from the pilot uh, or uh, or degradation of our friction test measurement, etc. The detail can you can be found in uh, Doc 9981. Okay, next code that I can show you is code two, which is relevant to us. Why? Because we have standing water here. So, like I said just now, the difference between standing water and wet is wet is three millimeter and below, while standing water is four millimeter and above. That's why you have to have a very good uh, ruler, you know, because if you have three millimeter, it's considered as wet, but you have four millimeter and above, it's already downgraded to become uh, standing water. That's why you have a very good ruler. Okay, uh, the next uh, code that we don't consider in our area, in, I mean in initial assignment only, eh, but it can be downgraded or upgraded, is code one and code zero, because why? You can see here, code one only consists of ice, and code zero only consists of wet ice, water on top of complete snow, and also dry snow on wet snow on top of ice, okay? Okay, we must know that for RCR, there are two parts of RCR. The first one is Aeroplane Performance Calculation Section. I short form it to become APC for us to easily remember. The second part of the, run, uh, the strings of RCR, what we call Situational Awareness Section, or I can uh, short it by SA. Easy, yeah? APC, SA. The, fun, the first one is APC, the second one is SA. Okay, let me explain further detail. What is APC and SA? Okay, you can see down here, I extract one example from document AIM, doc uh, 10066. This is the example of the snow temp that can be seen in the air, on the air. Okay, this is the output. So let us see which one is the APC and which one is the situation awareness. So the first part, the APC is this part. You can see the arrow. So these are the one. I will explain after this in detail. But I just want to show you these are the examples. One example given by IQ, which is this other one that is called aeroplane performance calculation section. And which one is the SA? So just the one SA. So everybody understand. This is the output that can be seen by the pilot or the user of the aerodrome up there, okay? Okay, let us go on the first part, which is APC, Aeroplane Performance Calculation Section. There are eight items. You can see logo of 811 on your right side, because why? Easy to remember. APC have got eight, and uh, SA have got 11. So it's not 711, it's 811. Okay, what are the eight of the APC? The first one is mandatory. If you see M here, it means mandatory. It's, it means you have to, you have to declare it. So the first one is mandated for you to declare is the aerodrome location indicator. 
And then the second one is the tape, date and time of assessment. I will show you the example after this so that all of us can get the clearer picture. And then the fourth one, which is runway condition code for each runway third. It's mean the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So all the first four is mandatory. You have got no choice but to declare it. And then the fifth one is conditional, which is the percentage coverage contaminant for each runway third. Why is it conditional? Because if it is dry, it is, we put it NR, no report. Or if the percentage of coverage is less than 10%, 5%, 9%, 8%, we put it at NR. That's why it is conditional. The next number six is another conditional item to be declared, which is death of loose contaminant for each runway third. Why is it conditional? Because only if there is standing water, four millimeter and above of thickness of depth of water, only you declare. For example, if you have four millimeter, you declare zero four. 100 millimeter, one zero zero. But if you have uh, three millimeter and below, you don't, you don't declare zero three. You must put what? You must put NR. Eh? One millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeters, you put NR. Four millimeter and above, zero four, zero five, one ten, one hundred, etc. Okay, that's why it is conditional. Number seven is on the condition description for each runway third. This is mandatory. Is it wet, 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 standing water, etc. Dry, wet, wet. We'll see after this example. It is mandatory. And the last one, which is optional, is the width of runway to which the runway condition could apply if less than published width. For example, if you have 45 meters of width of runway, like in Kelly A, uh, if you have ice, but here, here you don't have ice, you clear the ice only in the middle of 30 meters. So in this section, in this item, you declare three zero, but it is an optional, but usually we don't have that such case. So we just blank it out, okay? Okay, the second part of the uh, strings of this RCR, we call it SA, Situational Aware Section. It is 11 items. So you, can you see on your right side, almost all are optional, except for the first one, which is reduce, reduce runway length. It is conditional. Why? Because if you reduce runway length, for example, if your runway length is four kilometers, only three kilometers available. So we'll declare under this SA, 3,000 meter LDA available. Okay, if you know time it. So that's why it is conditional. But if you have a full slang of runway, it means you don't have to declare anything. And the rest is conditional. Number two is not related to our area, it's still optional. Uh, loose sand on the runway, if you have loose sand on the runway, you put optional. But in our case, if you have loose sand, we just ask them to clean it first because they, before they open the runway. Okay, and then number four is chemical treatment on the runway. It is mandatory. This is the only one that is mandated for the SA. But also in our area in Malaysia, we don't have case where we have to put chemical to, to melt all the ice or slush, etc. And then the fifth one is snow bank of the runway, not related to our area. Snow bank on the testway, not related. If you're not related, you just uh, vacant it, blank it. Okay, number eight one is related to us. So if something happened to your taxiway, for example, your taxiway is full with water, you can put taxiway Bravo poor, taxiway Alpha poor, taxiway uh, Charlie poor, for example, like that. I will show you after, after this, okay? And then uh, here also, apron condition. For example, North apron poor. South apron poor, so you, you it's optional for you to declare. Okay, so number 10 is state approved and published use of measured friction coefficient, so this is optional. And then number 11, sometimes you want to explain more plain language remarks, so it is also optional. Okay, okay, let us see the first uh, example here. So, for example, this is the APC. Eh? Remember the first part APC, APC have got eight items. So, the first item which is mandatory is the Aerodrome location indicator. For KLIA, we have WMKK. So it's up to your airport. And then the second mandatory item is the date and time of the assessment. Please note that we don't start with year. We start with month. 09 means September. 25 means 25th of September. 1400 means 1400 UTC. Remember, it is UTC time. Okay, the third one which is mandatory is the lower runway designation number. Remember, for this GRF RCR, you must declare the lower part of your runway. If for example, uh, our runway 3 is 1533. So here we put 15. 
So this runway 2 or runway 1, maybe 14L, so we put 14L. We don't put the 32R here, okay? Because why? All this measurement is we start from the lower part. For example, 552 means, the next one means, the first third category is 5. What is 5? Wet, remember? And then second, second third of the runway is 5. What is 5? Wet. And 2. What is 2? Standing water. So remember, this is very important. We start with the lower runway destination number. And the fifth one, which is uh, condi uh, conditional, is the co percentage coverage component of for each runway third. So it means that 50% of the first third full is covered with water or contaminant. This means 50% of second part of your runway also full with water. But remember, after this, I will show example. There's no 10, 20, uh, 10 or 30, etc. It is a squared by 25, 50, 75, and 80. I will show you example after this. Okay, the third one is the depth of those components for each runway third. Like I said just now, if you have dry or you have uh, less than uh, 3 millimeters, you don't put 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. You must put NR, no report. Eh? But if you have 4 millimeters and above, you put 04. If you have 10 millimeter, 10. If you have 100 millimeter, 100. Okay? And then the number 7 one is the condition description for each runway. Third. This is mandatory also. So it's mean wet, wet standing water. You see this 552, 5 is wet, 5 is wet. Two is standing water. That's why here it is wet, wet standing water. And then number eight, why? Uh, we don't show example here because it is the optional one and it is width of clear runway in meter. So it means if you don't have closure of some part of the width of your runway, you don't have to declare anything here. So the full example of your aeroplane performance calculation section or APC is WMKK. You must separate every item with a space here. Eh? You can see eh? space. If for the situation awareness, it is being separated by a full stop. But for the APC, you must separate them by a space. So the full section of APC is WMKK 0925-1400, space 14L, space 552, space 50-50-50, space NR-NR04, and space wet, wet standing water. Okay, you get it? So let, let me elaborate more on the depth just now. If you have less than 10%, you put NR, okay? On the second part of the runway, if you have uh, less than 10%, you put NR. You don't put uh, it uh, as a 0.9 or 0.5, etc. And then go back to the second table. Second table, like I said just now, if you have uh, assessment of 15%, for example, you don't put 1.5 here. You must put it as 25. You must square it as 25. If you have 35%, for example, you don't put as 35. You put here as 50. If you have, for example, 70, you don't put here 70. You must put it as 75. And you have 85%, for example, here, you put it as 100. So these are the output over here. Okay. Okay, let us see the second part of the RCR, which is situational awareness section. These are the example. Okay, let us go back to the table just now and link and compare this declaration with the one that we have just now. Okay, so here you can see the airport declare only four, which is the first one here, the runway to 2 LLDA reduced to 1450. It means that out of the full length of the runway, the available one is only 1,450 meters. And the second part is here, if you have drifting snow on the runway, you just put it drifting snow. And then the third one that I say just now, if your condition of some of the taxiway condition is poor, you just put taxiway Bravo poor, taxiway Alpha poor, taxiway Charlie poor, for example. And then the first example here is on apron condition. For example, your apron not poor, you just put apron not poor. But the rest you don't have to put. Why? Because, like for example, in this case, there's no such chemical treatment, so they just make it blank. No declaration. You don't have, uh, you don't want to explain a plain language, you just leave it blank like that. So understand? Eh? Okay, so after we have completed all the assessment, these are the ones that need to be submitted to the AI's office or the AIM office, which is called snow time format. Initially, when we start to venture this RCR, 
we are surprised. We don't have snow. Why should we feel the snow time format? Actually, if you can see from the above, this is available in DOC 10066. It is applicable as of 5th November 2020. In the same document, you can see applicable until 4 November 2020 is the previous format of the snow temp. So it's the new format of the snow temp which should be used only after 5th November 2020. But by now, you can already train your staff how to fill this snow temp format. This is the one that will be sent to the AIS office. So this is the first part of the page and this is the second part of the page. So uh, you have to train your staff. We have already trained our airport operator. It is one of the modules that I will show you in the second presentation. Okay. Okay, what are the challenges? The first one is the RCR should contain all necessary information for the determination of relevant runway condition for the performance assessment of the flight crew and pilot. The second one is aerodrome personnel should have the skill and knowledge to assess the condition of runway and produce accurate runway condition code. The third one is coordination with relevant parties. The, third one, the fourth one is the establishment of Malaysia standard reporting format. And the fifth challenge is to train all related parties. Why? Because sometimes we have different level of experience and exposure. Some of them reluctant to give up methods and practices used for many years. Management of change, we have to implement management of change for the aerodrome staff and all the other staff. And also how to ensure accurate assessment at busy runway. Because after heavy rain, we have to go inside. How about if your runway is busy? So you, it's a challenge, yeah. Okay, what are the different roles of different agencies, aerodrome operator, to assess the runway service condition, including contaminants for each third of runway length and report them by means of a uniform RCR to deploy GRF for runway service condition, and of course, to provide technical training to all relevant staff. All aerodrome inspector must be well trained how to do the assessment, how to do the calculation, how to do the estimation, so they must be trained. Okay, next is uh, a role by the AIS is to provide the information received in the RCR to the end users, the pilots, the aircraft operators, and so the air traffic services to convey the information received by the RCR and all special aircraft to end users, work mission, etc. Okay. Okay. What are some of the guidance material that has been uh, provided by IQ? We have Annex Six Part Two, the new Part Two Aeroplane Performance Manual, and then we have Annex Eight related to the manufacturing of aircraft. And in our part, we have Annex Fourteen Volume One, which is applicable the Eight Edition, uh, which is applicable Fifth November Twenty. There are some part of the content of the Annex Fourteen Eight Edition applicable 5th November, some part is applicable before 5th of November, okay? Fundamental provision for assessing and reporting runway service condition, we have very important document, Pants Aerodrome, DOC 9981, mostly is from here. And we have Circular 355, the more detail on how you must do, you, you do the assessment, measurement and reporting of runway service condition, it's good for you to expose this to the person who will do the assessment. And we have PENS ATM.4444 is just for the air traffic controllers. So these are all the documents, NX14, IQ, Volume 1, DOC 9981, uh, IQ DOC 10066, and IQ Circular 355. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, allow me to share a little bit on the second part of my presentation. Okay, I hope you can see my second part of presentation. The title is Implementation of GRF, RCR and Runway Inspector Program. If you don't see it, please give signal to me, the CM perspective, okay? So now I can show you the second, okay. I hope you see the objective. If you don't see the objective, please alert me. <laughs> okay, the objective of this presentation is to ensure aerodrome personnel trained in the relevant field of competence and their competence verified in a manner required by the state, which is CAM, to ensure confidence and accuracy in their assessment. Okay, it is mentioned in NS14 Volume 1, Section 2.9.4. So you must train all your relevant staff before they can uh, allow to make the assessment because the assessment is very important. Okay, the table of content, I'll share you on GRM RSF implementation roadmap in Malaysia. We have CRI program, Certified Runway Inspector program. We have uh, developed approved training module for GRF RCR and CRI. And also, we have conducted a train and trainer session in Malaysia. Okay, 
the roadmap is a very, we show, we have to ensure in the roadmap, a very clear objective, total runway inspection improvement, and also regional coordination, we are willing to share if any state are interested to uh, share with them. Okay, so these are basically a simple, uh, our roadmap we have done so far. We start in July 2019, we established a working group in terms of reference. Uh, I chair the group, uh, our team is around 20% from airport operator. And then the, uh, in August 2019, we have working group workshop with CM and Standard, which is us. In September 2019, we attend the ACI online course. I really recommend everybody who wants to know more about ACI GRF to attend this uh, online training course conducted by ACI. You have to pay uh, some very minimal amount, but it is very beneficial. Okay. And then in September 2019, uh, we prepare on runway inspector certification and RSR guideline because we have decided that alongside with the implementation of RCR GRF, we must introduce to certify, it is an optional to certify a runway inspector so that after they have attended so many training, we will issue them certificate. It's just that, okay? And then in September 2019, uh, it's a RCR training. We start RCR training with CM, with us. In September 2019, we table RCR, the Malaysia Airport uh, holding Berhad, table the RCR and uh, runway inspector roadmap to their ESCO and uh, fortunately their ESCO very supportive and approved because they need some budget to conduct all those uh, trainings, uh, seminars, etc. And uh, in October 2019, we engage with our counterpart, the controllers, air traffic controllers from KLIA and also from the headquarter, from the AIS office. And in November 2019, they start to develop with the observation by me in CM, training module development. And in January 2020, we in CM approved the modules. And in February 2020, we start with the first train the trainer session for runway inspector and RCR. In February 2020, we start to certify uh, the runway inspector. Uh, we estimate around 198 uh, inspectors, but due to the lockdown, so um, we have to delay the rest of the program that you can see. The meeting during National Runway Safety Program Committee, the session with stakeholders uh, to publish our aerodrome standard guidelines and uh, requirement and also try period. Hopefully after the lockdown over, maybe we can restart and hopefully by November 2020, we can launch this uh, RCR GRF implementation program. Okay, for certified program, let me show you for, uh, for a while. It's a classroom session. We have decided so mandat some mandatory courses for the runway inspector to attend before we can certify them as a qualified runway inspector. We have a very comprehensive assessment and uh, then we will issue them a certification to ensure to approve that they are competent runway inspector and all the approval and certification is by us CM. These are basically the uh, courses that need to be attended by them. There are six courses, airport operation level, and it's 14 volume one aerodrome, and it's 19 SMS, AIP, RT communication, and aerodrome inspection. So, only after they have completed all these six courses, we will issue them a certificate. And uh, the frequency is some of them is three years. Oh, most of them are three years, eh? okay? Okay, the training model for GFSR, so this other one, and it's 14, only one, the chapters, SMS uh, module, the chapters, AIP modules, all the section. This is the RT modules. Everybody who want to become runway inspector must have a radio telephony, must be fluent radio telephony capability with air traffic controllers or else we won't allow them to enter the runway. Okay, so in the detail of aerodrome inspection mo module, you can read it after this. There are six of them. Aerodrome inspection, GRF, snow temp. So you can see here the GRF uh, is around one to one and a half day module is inside this aerodrome inspection modules. We teach them how to issue the snow temp. Eh? And then we do some case study and then we teach them how the error manual, what is the content, latest as per recommended by uh, DOC9981. Before this, we refer error manual content from 9774. But in the new DOC9981, we have another format of error manual. So we, during this training, we teach them how actually we have to ensure your error manual is duly updated. And the last one is on the error safety requirement. So these are the content of inside the error insertion modules. 
these are the content inside the GRF RCR modules. So you can see inside here, we teach all those methods. So uh, we have conducted one train, the trainer session. So these are the picture, that's me doing only the opening. So I let them do the rest, I use the opening. <laughs> okay, so you can see on the right picture, there's a senior manager from Malaysia Airport giving a, a talk to we invite the first session all, almost all airport managers or operation uh, manager from respective airports and also the engineering staff and also some of them are from the training center. So these are the session that we do in February 2020. So this is the one that I really love most is because they have the initiative to paint a mock runway beside their training center. You can see here, you can see this is a mock of a runway holding position marking this uh, runway designation marking. So these are the aiming point marking, even though it's not as big as runway, the rear runway is a good training for them practically. Okay, you can see here, they conduct the uh, practical assessment on those all those different three thirds of the runway and they do group practical assessment. They do the real, some sort like uh, measurement of uh, the percentage of water they have on-site assessment. You can see the airport's manager go down and try hands-on how using the measuring wheel. So we setting more up area of the runway and after completed calculation, we will filling up RCR form, the one that I showed you just now, the ACI uh, RCR forms, okay? So on your left side above, uh, certified runway inspector is requesting approval from ATC prior entering runway. We teach them how to communicate with ATC, somebody on the other side uh, acting as an ATC. And then we measure affected area on runway. We simulate it by a bottle. You can see a bottle of water here. We don't put uh, real water or we have time to drain it out. So we, we simulate with a bottle of water. We put or measure how thickness so that we can declare it in our RCR. Uh, so this is all, okay? So this is the closing ceremony of all the participants. So thank you very much. Uh, I open to the question. I enroll back to the secretary. Thank you very much. So uh, Mr. Mayudin, I really have to thank you so much for sharing that with us because you've really shown how uh, Malaysia has taken on these uh, new requirements and you've developed uh, a complete and full understanding of what is needed and developed a very uh, uh, realistic and practical implementation plan and shown us how uh, how you're progressing towards that and and I, I saw from your implementation plan you plan to meet uh, the applicability date of 5th of November 2020 which is really what uh, what ICAO is seeking from uh, from all states uh, and all stakeholders who, who contribute to that to be able to achieve this uh, safety improvement for a runway uh, runway uh, performance. So, uh, so I really appreciate that. So I'm glad that we still have uh, some time for questions. So you're, you're very punctual. <laughs> we have 15 minutes left. Uh, so, uh, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the way we're going to moderate this is that uh, uh, you, you open up your participants dialogue box and then uh, you click on the raise hand function. And then uh, when we call your name and we apologize if it's not your real name, but we're going to call the name that we see <laughs> in the participants dialogue box, which is the name that you use to, uh, to, to register into Zoom. And then uh, please um, uh, just say your name, the state that you're coming from, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then your question. And then uh, we'll try to see uh, if we can answer. If it's to do with the technical requirements in Malaysia experience, uh, Mr. Mayuddin will, uh, will, uh, will answer. And if it's to do with what we are planning to do uh, within the region, in terms of supporting states with implementation, uh, uh, myself or, or one of my colleagues will, will attempt to answer. So uh, with that, uh, we've got our first question, which is from uh, Suvrita Saxena, if I've got that right. Uh, so please uh, unmute your mic and, and introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Mrs. Suvrita Saxena, uh, Director of Operations uh, Aerodrome Standards from DGCA India. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I have uh, two, three doubts uh, which I would like to uh, place here. Number one, uh, it was uh, mentioned about lower designation number for runway. I have a query. 
in case uh, uh, is it not dependent upon the orientation of the runway available for operation because for example we have 0927 runway uh, 09 is a lower designation number but if orientation is changed to runway 27 in that case how do we give a uh, uh, rcr uh, this is first question number 2 is uh, uh, the challenge regarding busy airport assessment Uh, in india various airports we have sporadic downpour downpour issues and uh, there is a dynamic nature of uh, rain especially in mumbai where we have a, a fast transition from uh, dry to wet to standing water so is there any method or modeling for standardizing the table for assessment with respect to uh, drainage characteristic slope rain and precipitation issues which can help the uh, inspectors to uh, do a better assessment uh, third question is regarding uh, do we have any uh, simulator kind of a training facility system for airport inspectors thank you very much so uh, mr bayudin do you want to try and take those on and if uh, if there's any pending i will i will try to complement okay i'll try to answer some of them mr mikhail will back me up Okay, related to the first one, if your runway is zero nine and two seven, you must start with zero nine. This is as simple as that. Okay, if you are zero eight and two six, you start with zero eight. Regardless whatever uh, your orientation or runway, you must start with the lower runway designation. For example, just now I give the example in Kila A where fourteen R, three uh, to left, we must start with one four R. So it is either two one uh, four or one four R, two or three only. Okay. And then the second part of the question, uh, we have some uh, same case in Kila A, for example. But we have planned that that is one of the challenge that I mentioned just now. Okay, uh, we have told our runway inspector during the heavy rain, you don't go inside. This is quite dangerous. Eh? There's lightning, etc. Only after the rain completed, you go inside and do the assessment. And if your runway is busy, do your assessment as uh, fast as possible. Remember, for this RCR, you must need to. Measure only two, which is the depth. You put the your ruler on the most deep part of your water. You measure five millimeter, and then you take out ruler, and then, then it's up to the. And then the next one is remember you estimate the percentage. If you have got time, you measure by the wheel. But if you don't have got time, you must estimate. I can assure you, ten percent is not small. We have tried in Malacca Airport. Ten percent is very big. It's very rare for you to this that ten percent coverage. So that's the only two things. And then you move to the second third, and then you move to the third third. So I think that's answer how we want to deal with the busy, uh, busy runway. Of course, you have to request ATC to clear the uh, aircraft. Don't don't land during we are doing measurement, please. Eh? That's why it's very important. Uh, the third one on similar training. I think I hand over back to our my friend Mr. Mikhail. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you for that. So, I don't know the answer. But uh, I just wanted to add to the uh, your response to the second question because I think she was also asking about changing uh, runway uh, surface conditions and uh, and in that regard, the the if you go through the uh, the guidance material, uh, there is a there's a a feature where if uh, flight crew experience uh, uh, runway surface conditions that are different than the ones that were in the uh, report that they received. And they're able to use the air rep to give information back to the ANSP, and, and that information is very important because uh, if the runway surface conditions have worsened, it's important that the follow-on traffic be uh, be aware of that, and 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 that's why through the ANSP, those uh, those air rep information will be channeled back to the oncoming factor. Of course, that can't go into a snow time because there's no no time for that, so that will actually be issued by ATS uh, directly to the incoming. Uh, Traffic. Uh, so, with the third question, I think it was, it was to do with how you simulate this. But I think you demonstrated that in your in your second presentation, how uh, you created a training environment of how to simulate uh, uh, these different conditions uh, and and to be able to, in a very practical way, provide training to the staff. So, I think you, you you've shown that quite well. All right. So, our next question is uh, from Amir Ashraf, NCMC from Pakistan, I believe. Over to you. Please uh, unmute your mic and ask a question. Good morning, and thank you very much for the presentation. I am uh, Zubair Ghazi uh, from Pakistan Civil Aviation Authority, and I am director uh, uh, 
airspace and aerodrome regulation focal person for the GRF implementation. Uh, my question, uh, we have two, three questions. Uh, I have only one question and uh, Captain Balban, my associate and member from OPS has two more questions. Uh, my question is uh, whether this uh, requirement is for uh, certified aerodromes only or it has to be implemented um, whether it is a certified aerodrome or an uncertified domestic airports. Thank you very much and uh, over to my associate, Mr. Captain Balban. I'm from the Flight Standards Directorate and uh, uh, I am uh, captain and type rated on 330 and 777. Uh, that was a uh, very fruitful and very useful information being uh, presented by Mr. Moebdeen. Uh, there are two, three small questions that we uh, want to explore. The first one is uh, about the braking action being reported by the pilot, you know. So is it going to be the same which is already depicted in the Jefferson or there are going to be some changes on that level, you know, fair, good or uh, poor, you know. Uh, second part is, uh, are there going to be any special emphasis during the simulator training of pilots, flight crew, uh, that the same can be covered, you know, during the three years of uh, cyclic training program in simulator training. And uh, that you, you were very right, you know, that you pointed out that uh, uh, there can be so many quick changes uh, about the downpour and about the condition of the runway. So that can also be assessed or reported during the pilot pilot report. Pilot can also report. So the incoming landing, they should be more cautious whether they can uh, make a landing out of it or they can divert. And when is this uh, training program going to be uh, on show in Kuala Lumpur that uh, we can be uh, part of that training and we can be trained accordingly? Because uh, at this time, because with the lockdown, maybe the things are going to be, you know, shifting ahead. Thank you again for your time. Okay, thank you for, I think, six questions. So I don't know if you've got all of my UD, but you, you give a, give, try to answer some of them. And if there's some pending, I will uh, compliment. Yeah, I'll try to answer right. the first one and the last one. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it is applicable to the certified and non certified aerodrome also, all aerodrome, but uh, Mr. Mikhail will uh, counter it for me. And then the last question related to training, we only can cover at this moment only related to the aerodrome personnel training. But the rest, I think you can refer to uh, IQ, Mr. Mikkel. Okay, I know, go back to you, Mr. Mikkel. Okay, so, so I think uh, on the first one, uh, the applicability of the new SARPs, you're, you're right, it's for all aerodromes. It's not limited to only certified aerodromes. So it's, an, it's a new Annex 14 SARP, so it's applicable to all, all aerodromes. And, and so, so uh, that should be implemented at a national level. And you can, you can imagine that if we had different provisions in, in different aerodromes, we would create a mix of uh, uh, methodologies which would create confusion and therefore the safety benefits would be, uh, be eroded. Uh, uh, in terms of the breaking action question, I, I wasn't too clear on, on whether it was to do with the terminology, but uh, flight crew will, will, and, and their ops support staff will receive the snow times, yeah? So within the snow time, they'll have the information that was presented by uh, Mr. Mayudin, and that's the information that will be used for the flight crew to be able to adjust their, their performance uh, uh, for the approach and, and, and landing. Uh, at the same time, uh, because of the changing conditions, uh, if, if there are changes, uh, there may be additional information that's delivered through, uh, through air traffic services. And of course, the flight crew that experience uh, differences, they can report it back through the air rep. So, so we mentioned that a little bit uh, uh, before so 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 that's the really the loop 
and, and the terminology is standardized. So I, I cannot comment on what Jepson has uh, because you mentioned that, uh, but it's the ICAO terminology based on these new requirements that would be used for all these, uh, these reports. Now, whether this uh, training will be included in the uh, flight crew simulator training, uh, I, I imagine so eventually, but, but I cannot say, say so because I'm not involved in that. But what I can share for flight crew is that uh, uh, Mr. Mayudin mentioned the ICAO ACI uh, online training course, which is, I agree, excellent. Uh, and it's good for airport operators and for ANSPs uh, at this time to be able to understand uh, all the new requirements. Uh, but uh, for flight crew, uh, there's an ICAO IATA online training course now. So uh, for flight crew, I would highly recommend uh, that that's the starting point. So, so that air, aircraft operators uh, make that training available to their flight crew. Uh, and it's available both on the ICAO and the IATA websites, and it's called ICAO IATA GRF uh, online training. And, and that's Mr. Mayudin said, it's not very, very expensive. And, and actually through the, uh, the cost caps, we've made uh, several accounts available to, uh, to the cost cap member states. So, so that, uh, that will be uh, available. Now, I know you asked, uh, Mr. Bayoudin, whether he's going to invite us all to KL for, for training. And, and, and you mentioned not just the difficulties of uh, the current travel restrictions, but of course, uh, uh, you know, in Malaysia, they need to be set up to offer this at an international level. And we've had uh, some preliminary discussions between ICAO and CAM on whether we can organize some regional training on this uh, subject uh, uh, on site in Malaysia. And of course, we'll come back to that uh, uh, when we're able to, to travel freely. Uh, at the same time, I want to share that uh, we have planned uh, uh, to hold in Bangkok, uh, uh, hosted by COSCAP Southeast Asia, the ACI classroom training course. So again, I'm in, uh, in discussion with uh, ACI on organizing this, but the dates cannot be uh, scheduled until we can be sure uh, that the event can be held and everybody can, can, uh, can attend. You know? so, so those are the, some of the follow-on trainings that are going to be made available. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, this is the first uh, webinar to share with you the experience from uh, Malaysia. Uh, but we do ex expect to have a couple of more uh, by other states. And, and uh, Republic of Korea is one state that has uh, mentioned to ICAO that they would be willing to host a future webinar. And that will be useful for the states that have more uh, uh, wintry conditions with ice and snow and slush, because then they can show the other side of it as well, you know, that's how, how it affects uh, operations in the, in, in the northern uh, uh, conditions, uh, winter conditions. So um, I think we've, we've covered uh, hopefully uh, most of Pakistan's questions because you had very many. And, and, uh, and we'll co continue now with a few more while we have time. I think maybe we have time for one more and then I'll close. Uh, uh, but uh, don't despair. Uh, I think the best uh, option for those that will have questions uh, that remain after this uh, this webinar because I see some are being uh, typed into the chat function, which we, uh, we we shared with you that we wouldn't be able to monitor during the session. Uh, but we'll we'll come back to the chat uh, questions later, and any follow-on questions will be submitted by can be submitted by email as well to to us, uh, anyone in ICAO, and then uh, we will share that with Mr. Mayudin as well, and we will provide uh, responses to you on those uh, on on those questions uh, as soon as we can. So for now, uh, during the webinar, I know we're already uh, on, on, at the time, but I'm going to take one more question and then, uh, and then probably we'll close. And so after that, please send your questions by email. So I, I don't know what your name is, but I've got TDV here. So if TDV can please uh, uh, unmute the mic and ask the question. Uh, hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the great uh, uh, presentation. I'm Dat Nguyen uh, from uh, Civil uh, Aviation uh, Authority of Vietnam. Currently, uh, our DZ has uh, approved uh, the guideline for uh, the ZIF uh, implementation and uh, also uh, 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 approved uh, the roadmap, the implementation uh, plan for, uh, impl uh, for implementation. Uh, uh, the roadmap, uh, our roadmap includes uh, 12 steps uh, from now until uh, November uh, to uh, uh, but uh, there are still uh, the two steps uh, that uh, we need uh, you to uh, uh, share your uh, uh, experience and uh, uh, guide us how to uh, the, uh, how to do them. Uh, the, the first one is uh, the step uh, uh, 
identify uh, procedure and uh, guidance material to be developed uh, and uh, amended. Uh, and uh, uh, the second step is uh, identify necessary means and resources for the implementation, uh, like a human finance material and a facility uh, to uh, deploy uh, the uh, uh, implementation plans. Uh, could you share your experience uh, from uh, other country uh, how to uh, identify and uh, implement uh, and uh, deploy uh, them? Thank you very much. So Mr. Mayudin, you want to have a go at that? Okay, He's the asked first one. Uh, uh, the development first of one. guidance material. Okay, on the procedure and guidance material, in our uh, state level, we have already produced uh, guidance for all those admin operators, but like the timeline that I show you just now, Due to lockdown, we have to hold it first. We expect another one or two months. I think uh, we're going to have that. But before that, we uh, mainly we refer to the guideline as shown in the doc 9981. Most of it is already covered inside there. And the more detailed guideline is on the circular three something just now I mentioned to you. So it's a more detailed guideline. Uh, so second one is related to necessary needs for financial, etc. That's why just now I present to you uh, Malaysia Airport Holding as a corporate company have requested some budgetary from their management and fortunately they have got some but the budgetary is more on related to all the training. I can see that on the training because they are using existing staff. They already got runway inspectors but the rest of the thing is just you have to train them. So you have some sort of like planning and financial, some small to, to conduct the training. I think I'll over back to Mr. Mikhail for more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayuri. So uh, I think we're, we're coming to the end now. And, and as I mentioned, uh, don't despair. This is the first of a few more to come. Uh, so we as a, communicate, a community involved with uh, GRF implementation, we can come back together and we can have more uh, discussions in the future. So uh, I want to thank uh, warmly uh, Mr. Mayuri uh, from the CIA Malaysia. You, you've done an excellent job in, in sharing your, your countries and your own experience with the implementation and the planning and preparation and training. So I think it's been very, very useful to everybody. Uh, the presentation has been uploaded onto the uh, website and I put the website link uh, in the group chat. So if you look in the chat function, you'll find the uh, website. But uh, if you forget, uh, you can always go to the IKO website to look for COSCAP and then on the COSCAP you'll find training and under there you'll find the uh, presentation that was delivered today by uh, Mr. Mayudin. Uh, any feedback that you have on the webinar, both on the subject matter and the conduct, and also any questions you have on the subject for IKEO or for Mr. Mayudin, uh, please send them through by email to any of us, and uh, we'll make sure that you get an answer, and we'll share some of these uh, questions and answers with the, the wider community uh, in future sessions. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, I, I do want to stress that uh, we have seen a very good example from Malaysia today. But the reality is that most countries are not as prepared as Malaysia is. And, and there's very little time left. Yeah, the 5th of November is around the corner. And, and only to complicate matters further, uh, we have current uh, uh, difficulties with, uh, with working at the office and things like that. So it's become even more difficult uh, to, to prepare for this and, and to train the staff and so forth. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we need to continue working on this goal of achieving the implementation by the 5th of November. So uh, to help states with this, uh, we, we have created a template for an implementation plan. Uh, this is the first step. If you have not up to today uh, assigned a focal point in your CAA to lead and coordinate the GRF implementation, if you have not yet identified your stakeholders and focal points, if you have not yet developed an implementation plan, uh, to embark on the preparations. Uh, that's really what you need to focus on today. So if you have not done that, uh, uh, have a look at the template we've prepared. Again, the link for that has been added to the chat, uh, so you can uh, look for it there. If you don't uh, find it there, you can go to our website or email us. But uh, uh, please, please have your implementation plan developed, uh, nominate your focal points and start working on this. And, and uh, the training, a lot of the initial training can be done online. As was mentioned by Mr. Mayudin, we have uh, two online courses available today, and there's a third one under development for the ANSPs. Uh, so take advantage right now of that online training, which is uh, not, not very lengthy, it's not very expensive, and it really gives a very clear 
uh, explanation on uh, what the requirements are and how best to, to implement. So, so please take advantage of that. And then in the future, we'll have more of these webinars that I mentioned. And uh, once we can travel, uh, we'll have classroom training, both in Bangkok and hopefully also in, uh, in KL yeah, with, with the CAM and, and the airport authority there. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to close the webinar today. Again, thank you very much, Mr. Mayudin. I think we had an excellent webinar today. I think you've helped uh, states all over Asia Pacific to have a better understanding of what, uh, what the requirements are, what the objectives are, what the benefits are and why we are doing all of this. So with that, uh, I'll close the webinar today and uh, I wish everybody to have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you from Pakistan.